the governor or the secretary, could you talk a little bit about what you launched today in terms of the prescription monitoring program sure. and how you anticipate getting more doctors enrolled in that? Sure. So um, at uh, 7 a.m. this morning, uh, the new prescription monitoring program for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, was open for business. It is now called MassPAT because we always have to have a cute name for everything we do in the Commonwealth. Um, at this point, we have 70% of prescribers have uh, signed up for the PMP, and we're particularly focused who were 70% um, of prescribers who are on the old PMP. Uh, and we're particularly focused on the individuals who have prescribed uh, within the last six months in opioid. And so 63% of prescribers who have prescribed an opioid in the last six months are now on the PMP. We've seen an uptick um, every day. So I'll just give you one statistic. So on August 12th, 16,102 individuals had signed on to the new prescribing program. And on August 22nd, it was this morning, it was 31,909. So this is sort of an open, right. continuous mm -hmm. enrollment. It takes three minutes if you're organized to register. If you don't have all of your papers in front of you, it takes at most five minutes for the new PMP. So we are seeing the progress. And the reality is many prescribers will probably not register until they need to write a prescription. Mm -hmm. But we are targeting the individuals who have written um, a prescription in the past six months with uh, individual emails from us, contacts through their medical professional organizations and the like. So we're, we're feeling good about that. The other thing, as of this morning, we have the ability to share data with three of the five New England states. Um, the two that we can't at this point is dependent upon those states. That's New Hampshire, who is developing their own PMP, and Maine, um, which is changing their PMP. So in the fall, we'll have the ability to share our data with Maine and New Hampshire as soon as New Hampshire develops its PMP. On August 29th, we will have uh, the data sharing agreement with the state of New York. So we're feeling good about that. So we have the we um, have reached out to 37 states to have the ability to data share with at this point. But they would have to join. They would, they would have to join on to this particular program. Um, th there's like portals, so you can you you relate through a portal system. And is, the, is it mandatory for doctors to have to use this, and what kind of enforcement would it be to get doctors? I'm going to turn that over to our state's doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so the prescription monitoring system as of October 15th, any time um, a scheduled um, two or three drug is written, you have to check the PMP. Right now it's for new prescriptions. And I must tell you, having um, practiced in clinical practice myself, the PMP is such a useful tool that many individuals use it as part of their clinical judgment already. Um, in the new prescription monitoring system, um, one of the benefits of it, the Secretary mentioned the ability to quickly sign up. So we have improved that greatly. Additionally, the interface is much more user friendly. And when you check for data, when we checked this morning, it's 1.5 seconds for the data to be retrieved. So it's an efficient, quick system that can be incorporated into electronic health record systems within hospitals and clinics and um, has this interstate um, um, interoperability as well. Can I, can I ask a question? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Governor. <laughs> I'm, asking, I'm asking the question I actually don't know the answer to, which is um, one of the things I had a bunch of prescribers <laughs> raised with me as an issue at various points along the way with the old system is that it really couldn't tell them anything about where they fit relative to their peers okay. and that that would have made them question. a lot more interested in using it if it did. I know we had conversations about trying to figure out how to make that part of this release. I don't okay. know if it's in or not. Yes, so in addition to the providers being much more easily able to access the data in the background at an aggregate level, we can uh, um, accumulate data more easily and print reports and we'll be having the capacity to give individual providers a um, benchmark of where they are compared to others. I think that's going to be helpful. I think that's going to um, and, and since this is your press conference, Governor, um, in March, in fact, we have um, to prepare, a st we have to um, submit information to the legislature on basically a benchmark on where we are in prescribing practices in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I, I do think that that will be a very useful uh, report Talk a little card. What about the EDs? The emergency rooms? Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> well, they exist in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. No, I know, but the point is, 
They were, they were, um, yes. <coughs> they were one of the hardest to bring in under the old one. I think they're going to be relatively easy to get in. Yes, no, the, um, the emergency room, the Mass Hospital Association and the emergency room physicians groups, um, uh, one of their biggest concerns was, in fact, the, um, the slowness of the <laughs> former PMP. And uh, they were one of the, the American College of Emergency Room Doctors, I'm not getting the correct title, um, has been one of the fastest um, groups to sign on to the new PMP. So we're very encouraged by that. Mm -hmm. It's very facile, mm -hmm. this system. Governor, the last, the last release of data on, this, on, the, on the death totals in Massachusetts showed that prescriptions were actually on the decline and the number of people getting prescriptions were on the decline, which I suppose is good news, but deaths were still rising. I think uh, DPH attributed some of that to fentanyl. Is there anything yeah. you're doing with law enforcement or otherwise to, to tackle that problem, which is kind of persistent? Well, I'd say a couple things. The first is um, there were sort of four elements to the set of recommendations that were made by the task force, some of which involved prevention and education, some of which involved intervention, and some of which involved uh, treatment and recovery. And uh, and we're, I think we're making progress on all of those. But I said at the time that uh, one of the things that troubled me about this was the incredible negative momentum that this particular issue had and that I expected that it would take a while for some of these interventions to actually start to, to succeed in, in bending the trend a bit on, on both the death data and the overdose data. And the, um, the arrival of fentanyl is a more significant part of this conversation. Uh, and, the, and the reality of fentanyl out on the street um, is, a, is a wrinkle to this process that um, I think we suspected might end up being part of this, but it came at us, I think, in a way that came as a surprise given the volume and the distribution of it. And that's not just true here in Massachusetts. That's been true all over the country. And if you look at the, the overdose and the death data, historically, opioids uh, represented about two-thirds. And when I say opioids, I mean like prescription pain meds represented about two-thirds of the, of the deaths nationally associated with this, and, and heroin represented about a third. And you can see over the course of the last year or so, the heroin number has come up relative to the pain medication number, and that's driven primarily by the presence of fentanyl. Now, we've passed legislation that didn't exist um, to, make, uh, to make the distribution of fentanyl um, a, a felony here in Massachusetts, but I believe, um, I believe there's a lot of work that could be and should be done between, uh, between law enforcement at the state and local level, some of which we're doing, but also law enforcement across state lines. And actually, when the New England governors are here next week, one of the things I want to talk to them about is whether there are more things we can be doing across state lines um, to deal with the, with the law enforcement and the interdiction issue. The other issue I would say about that um, is we did, um, we did seek um, some additional funding to do some additional work on this issue. Uh, in the budget, which didn't make it through, and, and we're debating whether or not we should go back and see if we can take a second run at getting that. Because clearly one of the things um, we're going to need to do, especially deal with the fentanyl issue, is uh, is to take a harder run at some of the issues around trafficking. Last question, everybody. Yeah, kind of following up on one of your questions. Um, when, as you monitor... Well, let me go back over there. <laughs> and let, and let the secretary answer, yeah. Uh, Will physicians uh, be notified? Will, uh, will there be red flags raised in the state calling to ask questions if you're finding physicians that are, uh, that are prescribing the most? Yeah, you should take that one. Um, so already in the current prescription monitoring system, physicians receive emails and notifications when they have a patient of concern, and this will continue in a more efficient way, and actually the interface is more user-friendly so that you can more easily understand which of your patients and individuals that you're interacting with might have some activity of concern so you can take that into your clinical judgment. And would that apply if not an individual patient, but uh, say the, the, it's prescribing a, for a lot of patients? in excess of the average. Yes, so we will be able, again, the data is much more easy to use at an aggregate level as well, so that we can see which physicians and other prescribers are prescribing what, and then report back to them that information. Okay. You, you said we will be able to, but do you plan to? So if someone gets Absolutely. Yes, it, when I say we will be able to, with this new system, it gives us the capacity to quickly put together these reports, and we will be um, providing that information back to the prescribers.
And what, what is there a percentile of people who are above the 95th percentile in terms of prescribing uh, Schedule One, Schedule, schedule Two, and Schedule Three drugs? Will they be getting a call? Will, is there some kind of so it's not patient? delineated th that way. It depends on what the person's clinical practice is as well. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a, you know, so for example, a cancer doctor may be in that percentile for an appropriate reason, as an example. Um, so what we will do is we'll provide the information and then allow that to be part of the um, clinical assessment that is made.